we have an opportunity now for a conversation again, and uh, it gives some indication of the intensity of the topics that we're discussing this morning that apparently during the, the last session there were 240 questions that were uh, given. So let it be said that we're not planning to do 240 responses, but uh, we will have an opportunity for probably 10 or so of those questions. and. We want to jump right into that. And then after we've had an opportunity to do that, then we'll have an opportunity for, uh, for Tom and I to have a conversation about some of the implications of what it is that we've been talking about this morning, but also uh, in, the, in the sessions before this. So let's just uh, turn immediately to the questions that are being asked. So the, our first question. In 2 Peter 3, 10 and 12, does Peter contradict your understanding of Paul that, quote, the earth and its works will be burned up? This is one of the very, very rare passages in the whole New Testament where there's a very serious dislocation of the text. And it looks as though early scribes were as puzzled about this passage as we are because uh, it's not just there are tiny little verbal variations. There's, there's a very significantly... Um, very significantly different, uh, different set of words. And one of the most um, likely translations actually... This is 3.10. Uh, the, the, the last word there, um, just checking the precise thing. Yeah, there, there's, there's several lines of textual apparatus at yes. that point. And this, this, is, this is unusual. You know, occasionally there are things like this in the New Testament. This is very unusual. But the likely text, this is one of the most recent editions of the Greek New Testament. Most likely text is not a word meaning burned up, but meaning found, F-O-U-N-D, hurethesitai, which seems to mean will be disclosed. The earth and everything that's on it will be revealed for what it really is. In other words, though some scribes may have taken this uh, in a sort of stoic direction, that is to say the world is heading for a great conflagration in which it'll all be destroyed, um, the current scholarship indicates or some current scholarship indicates that the original idea was that God will do something great and enormous which will reveal the way that things truly are which is much more than in keeping with the rest of the New Testament you might say that that's a reason for supposing that that was a the scribes are correcting it to make it more like the rest of the New Testament and textual critics go around that loop all the time I have a section on this predictably in um, the resurrection of the Son of God so if anyone wants to follow Follow it up. Uh, okay, that was 10 years ago, and there's been some scholarship on it since then. But that would be the section on that in RSG would be a good place to start, and you could follow from there. Um, remember that for the Stoics who did believe that the world was heading for a great conflagration, this was not uh, a sense of the world being burnt up in order to be destroyed, because for the Stoics, fire was the hidden substance of all things, so that finally the world would become truly itself, would, would, would be pure, and, and would become completely fire in a good sense, in order to be fully purified and then start over again, um, so that it wouldn't mean what we might think it would mean when uh, uh, the idea of the world being burnt up. Okay, thank you. Next question. Ah. <laughs> I, what does Paul mean in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17? Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I suspect this question may have been texted before I expounded that passage um, because, in, in fact, it seems to me clear that this, as I say, is a combination of metaphors. Moses coming down the mountain with the law, um, the Son of Man being exalted on the clouds. This is a way of... I mean, okay, face it. When we're talking about heaven and earth, we don't have good language. We very quickly get to the limits of our language, as we do in many human situations. You know, in times of extreme bliss or extreme horror, we quickly run out of adjectives. In the same way, when we're talking about moments when and places where heaven and earth come together, metaphor and myth and symbol are the only language we've got to talk about that and so the idea that this is a prediction of people going up I can't, you know that wonderful story uh, robin scroggs in union seminary somebody asked him in class professor scroggs what is the parousia and he said you, you one day you'll look out of the window and you'll see all these people going up in the air and you'll say to yourself well i'll be damned <laughs> <laughs> This is, 
this is just a complete parody of what Paul is doing. Paul is saying something for which the only language is biblical imagery and symbol. But in the middle of that, it is the king coming back to his city and the citizens going out to greet him, not in order that he can then take them off somewhere else, but in order that they can escort him royally into his city to establish his reign there. That's, that's the picture that we're talking right. about. I think these questions, and I'm sure the ones that are coming, are, are in part coming because it's it, the eschatological vision that has been so framing, especially to a lot of Protestant life that has mm. gone on in all of our existence and for several generations sure. at least sure. before us, is framed by a completely different vision of this intermediate yeah. state of life. Yeah. Both this yeah. life now and the intermediate state between now yeah. and the culmination yeah. of all yeah. things in the rest the, of the, the, the intermediate state is difficult. Uh, I had this extraordinary experience three years ago where I was asked to go and do a lecture to the Christian Philosophers Association meeting in Fordham University in New York, and they wanted me to talk about body, soul, dualism, or monism, or whatever, in terms of the intermediate state. And it was extraordinary because I was due to fly on the Thursday, and on the Wednesday my father died, not unexpectedly, but I thought, should I cancel? And my siblings said, no, um, the funeral isn't going to be for another week. You go and do this. So I gave this lecture in New York on what we think about all that with the fact of my own beloved 91-year-old father, um, very, very present. That lecture is published now as an essay in the book called Pauline Perspectives, which is a collection of my essays. And that says everything that I currently think I want to say about the intermediate state. Um, the Bible uses a variety of different language systems. I, use, I mentioned John Polkinghorne's thing about hardware and software. The Wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha in chapter 3 talks about the souls of the righteous being in the hand of God. And that is often misunderstood because people hear Wisdom of Solomon 3 verses 1 to 3 and they think this is a statement of ultimate destiny. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, they are at peace. Fine, end of conversation. No, the passage goes on. At the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and run like sparks through the stubble and the Lord will set them over nations and kingdoms. And then you go into chapters 3 and 4 of Wisdom of Solomon, which is a wonderful eschatological scenario in which the wicked are horrified because here are the righteous back again. This is resurrection. So the idea of the souls in the hand of God is a way of talking about um, the intermediate state, not an ultimate destination. But that shows up the fact that the New Testament never uses that language. And so we, we really, if we want to be strictly canonically, Protestantly canonically biblical, because wisdom is in the Catholic canon, of course, um, then we must be reticent. And, and, and we must see all our language about that time as provisional and subject to, you know, but that's only a, a signpost sort of thing. Well, I do think that there's a, there's a, it has to be admitted that there's a sort of freak out quality to what you're suggesting. Uh, <laughs> not because it's not biblical, but because it's so different mm -hmm. from the social, psychological, theological world in which uh, mm -hmm. so much Protestantism mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. functioned. So I'm sure that we will touch on that nerve. Let's see the next yeah. question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In light of your eschatological view, can you explain <laughs> where you land on premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism <laughs> positions? Congratulations. <laughs> I have a good friend, this is another story, but it makes the point, um, good friend from my Montreal days, who's an Anglican priest and was asked one day by a Baptist friend, what do Anglicans believe about the second coming? And he thought for a minute, he said, he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead and of his kingdom there will be no end. And there was a pause and the Baptist said, that's all? And a friend said, yeah. And then the Baptist said, that's refreshing. No, that let's not be too, as with intermediate states, let's not be too picky to define what's what. The danger is not so much pre, post, or A, as what are the ideologies that are either driven by funding or are funded by those things. One of the dangers, obviously, with premillennialism is that it can become radically dualist. I suspect there are many different varieties which I'm ignorant of, some of which are less dualistic than others. But often the premill thing is the world is just getting worse and worse and worse. There's nothing we can do, and one day, etc., etc. The danger with the post-millennial thing is that it can just become triumphalist. Very interesting. Not a lot of people realize that 
Handel's Messiah, the libretto for Handel's Messiah, is written out of an early 18th century premillennialism where, very interesting, the Hallelujah Chorus does not come at the end of Handel's Messiah. It comes at the end of part two, immediately after their sound has gone out into all the world and the words to the ends of the earth, immediately after the nations raging and yet God setting his king over them. In other words, the preaching of the gospel will bring the nations into submission before the resurrection of the dead. Now, the danger with that, and it was not entirely escaped in some of the missionary work, not all of the 18th and 19th centuries, was a sense of we're going out to build the kingdom. That's it. Um, and then all sorts of things happened socially, socially and culturally, which made people say, uh, no, that's no good. Um, I was recently accused in a review of being a post-millennialist. I'm not in that sense. But if I had to choose between pre and post, I would definitely be post. Um, but happily, we don't have to make that choice. And you would happily, you would be post largely because of the sense of the integration, the validation of yeah, creation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and because of the sense of the genuine inauguration of the kingdom, when Paul says Jesus is all already reigning. And Matthew's Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And the danger with pre-mill is that you just don't take that seriously. Next question. If earth is already crowded, how will everyone fit in the renewed creation after the resurrection? That's rather like it's rather like the question somebody asked Tertullian: If a cannibal eats a Christian and then the cannibal gets converted, who will have which bits at the resurrection? You know, um, uh, the, 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 had you not heard that before? <laughs> that is so bizarre. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, you know, God is the creator. Actually, even today, the entire population of the whole world could probably fit into, I don't know, the southern half of California quite comfortably. It wouldn't be much space, but, but you could do it. Wouldn't be enough to drink, but that would be another question. Um, uh, if God is going to make new heavens and new earth, you know, let's not think. This is the point. It's not simply back to exactly where we were before. Um, and there's all sorts of other issues going on there. Uh, you know, the rabbis in the second, third, and fourth, and fifth centuries constantly were faced with questions about the resurrection. And there's stuff in the Babylonian Talmud about the debates that they had, which actually matches some of the debates that the church fathers had, because if you believe in resurrection, you will face those questions. Um, but the ultimate answer is, look, God is the creator. And um, actually, Origen had a good answer to Tertullian's question, which was, or the question somebody asked Tertullian, which is that um, actually our bodies are as they are in a state of flux. Um, the entire molecular kit of the human body changes roughly every seven years. The ancients knew that as well as we do. It didn't just fingernails and hair that drop off it's actually the whole kit changes so that you don't need the same exact molecules back c.s lewis says this in miracles it's a very helpful passage um god paul says gives it a body and i believe that in many cases god will use the bones and so on that are there already but it doesn't need to be like in you know, a debate they they take the rabbis take ezekiel 37 and they say well it looks as though god's going to start with the bones and work up from there um and some others say both rabbis and fathers no god will start with the soul whatever that is and gradually firm it up and these are all ways of saying we don't actually know how god's going to do what god's going to do um but we trust him and whenever you get muddled or worried or your head starts to swim about that just go back to the easter stories and think of mary and thomas and peter and all the rest of them faced with the risen jesus yes this is incredible but it's true and and that's that's what we have to go back to and i do think that just from a pastoral point of view often what's happening in that is that people are clinging to a desire for a much greater knowledge than is actually accessible so the humility yeah, to yeah, just yeah. admit that we have a confidence without a certainty and a yeah. and an assurance without full clarity right, we see right, that we right. see sort of best darkly is all part of what this is and, about. and this is why as i'm so glad you played the the clip about the artwork again this is where art and music can really, really, really help us. We are starved imaginatively as Christians, and Christian art easily collapses into sentimentalism, just as contemporary postmodern art easily collapses into brutalism. Um, and 
both of those are ways of seeing something but not the whole picture, that sentimentalism is what you get when you're determined to smile even if the whole world's falling apart and, you just, and it becomes inane, the sort of silly grin. And sadly, there's a lot of Christian art which is like that. But actually... Christians ought to be in the forefront of the art and the music because that creates the imaginative world within which it's possible to think differently about things. Um, and I think the secular world has done a pretty good job, and we've colluded with that, of keeping our imaginative levels down to the level of 18th and 19th century Epicureanism or deism, so that heaven is just this odd place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have, and we need the new art and the new music, which will create a world in which it makes sense to think of these things. I think the contrast is that it's often possible to feel, as a pastor or as a Christian leader, that you're put into a position where you're needing or wanting, you're being asked for what you really don't actually have to give, except yeah, the certainty yeah, yeah. Of, of trust in a God yeah. who has acted and spoken in Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. And that sometimes feels like it's not enough. So you're tempted to want to say, oh no, let me give you more information. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's going to be like this. This is what the streets yeah, yeah. are going to look like. Yeah, this is yeah, what the yeah, music yeah, will yeah, be yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. And it moves you down a certainty, a road towards certainty, which doesn't exist and which is- I, I fully agree. I mean, when I have been with people, either people who are dying or people who've got relatives who are dying, there are just those basic scriptural passages which don't give you more than a picture, but which give you a picture where sometimes you can actually feel people's body language change as you read Psalm 23, or indeed John 14. And I wouldn't in that, that moment explain that the Monai Poli are actually temporary resting places. It's just, it's enough to know that Jesus is looking after you and is sorting this one out. And that that's the thing, not where will I be, but who will I be with? That's and Paul, Paul's great line in Philippians 1, my desire is to depart and be with the Messiah, which is far better. If you want anything else other than that, then your wants need to be redirected because actually, as the hymn says, yea, all I need in thee to find. And, 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 and that's, that's difficult. That's a spiritual discipline to learn throughout one's life only really to want Jesus and to want everything else only in him. That, that's really hard. That's a lifetime's <laughs> spiritual right. journey. Yes. But that's, that's where it's got to end up. Right, right. Thank you. Next question. If this world is going to be renewed anyway, why should we sacrifice human economic well-being now for protecting <laughs> endangered species or altering our lifestyles? <laughs> There's two or three things to say about that. Um, uh, if you were a pastor and somebody came to you and said, look, I'm a Christian, so one day God is going to make me over again and in my new body I won't be able to sin, that's going to happen, so I'm just not going to bother about working at not sinning now. You know, stuff happens and that's too bad, but one day God will sort it all out. You would want to hit them with some pretty clear inaugurated eschatology. You know, you want, you want to say, no, sorry, precisely because you're going to be like that then, this is who you must be now. And the life of Christian virtue is practicing for the future. Um, when Paul says these three things abide, faith, hope, and love, in other words, get on practicing them now because they will last into the new world. They are all about trusting and celebrating and loving God. We're going to be doing that totally in the future. It's like, you know, if you're invited to go on tour with a choir or an orchestra or something, you want to practice the music in advance so that when you're doing it, you won't be messing it up there. That, and that's, that's how it works. So the same, if we are going to be the ones who are the wise stewards of God's ultimate new creation, and if Jesus, this is the thing, if Jesus is already raised from the dead, and the way the resurrection stories are told in the Gospels, particularly John, it's clear to me, I think, I've got a Johannine expert in the front row, I need to check this out, but um, it's, it's clear to me that John 20 is told in such a way as to say, this is the first day of the new week, this is the beginning of new creation. We live between the beginning of new creation and the ultimate new creation, we've got to be doing that stuff. Now, that's the first thing to say. Second thing to say is, What's this bit about sacrificing economic well-being? Excuse me, whose economic well-being? Um, we live in this tiny bubble called the rich West, and there are millions of our fellow human beings who have no economic well-being now, partly because the banking structures over the ever since the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944 have quite systematically kept the poorest nations very poor. We've begun to do some things about that. We haven't done 
nearly, nearly, nearly enough. We are inflicting accidentally on lots of our fellow human beings stuff which, if it was done to us as private citizens, we would be going straight to our lawyers and demanding that it gets sorted out. How do you interpret John 14, 3? I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to myself. Yeah, th that's obviously part of that little passage at the beginning of John 14, where he says, in my father's house are, and I've quoted it twice already today, many dwellings. The King James Version was many mansions, which was kind of gave rise to all sorts of ideas. Um, you know, millionaire's row, you know, all these sort of extraordinary places. Um, but but the, Greek word, the Greek word is poli monai, M-O-N alpha I M mu American noon alpha iota, monai. And if you look up mone in the Greek lexicon, it isn't a fabulous dwelling place. It is a wayside inn or a dwelling to which you go to be refreshed before continuing your journey. Now, I don't know if you want to press that too far, but um, clearly in John, from John 5 and onward to the resurrection chapters, John believes in the resurrection. He doesn't believe in um, an ultimate disembodied future. People have often read John like that. Bultman read John like that and therefore said that chapter 5 was the work of a later reactor, bring, a redactor, bringing this Jewish resurrection stuff into a gospel that wasn't really going there. But I think it works the other way. We have to say, no, John is all about creation and new creation. Therefore, Jesus' assurance to the disciples that he is going. It's like when Jesus says to Mary, don't cling on to me. Maybe, maybe we'll have to what does that mean touching or clinging or whatever it's very difficult um uh, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. This is very, very, very mysterious stuff. We're talking again about the heaven-earth interface and overlap, and we don't have good language for that. So if I was preaching on John 14, well, you can go and look at my mini-commentary and see what... I can't remember what I said there, actually, but um, uh, if I were preaching on that now, I would want to say Jesus is explaining to the disciples that he has to do something which they are not expecting at all, and it's to do with going away, but it's going away to get something ready. But here's the thing. It's like in First Peter, when we have a salvation which is kept in heaven for you, and our tradition has taught us to say, it's kept in heaven, so you have to go there to enjoy it. And I've said many times, that's like if I am coming home from work, but my wife is going out to the evening for the evening, she may leave me a message saying, your supper is in the oven. It's kept in the oven. For It doesn't mean I have to get in the oven to eat the supper. Um, <laughs> it means means <laughs> it's, it's safe there, it's keeping warm. When you arrive, get it out of the oven, you know. Um, <laughs> so the fact that something is kept in heaven for you doesn't mean you have to go to... Heaven is the place where God's future purposes are stored. And the New Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth so that the dwelling of God is with humans. And this is, it's so, you know, I can feel with these questions, and we, we all feel this because this culture is so prevalent that we can hold in our minds the idea of new creation and resurrection. And then the minute we let down our guard, we flick back to default mode. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, we still think in the old way. And this is why Easter, this is why we in the West don't do Easter properly, because we don't actually deeply believe in what it's saying. Go to the Orthodox churches in the East. Easter is what it's all about. It's about new creation. Oh, they make other mistakes, but they don't make that one. <laughs> Next question. How do we understand hell? <laughs> What is your understanding of the, the universal restoration will all eventually be safe? I would be very worried if I understood hell. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it seems to me that, um, okay, you know, again, we all come with pictures like Dante's Inferno or the Sistine Chapel. And uh, having mentioned the Orthodox, let me, let me say this, because I, I find this helpful reflection, though it's frustrating because it doesn't end, as it were. 
the one time I went to a service in the Sistine Chapel was a great occasion at the end of the 2008 Synod of Bishops, and I was an ecumenical observer, and I was sitting next to a Greek Orthodox Archimandrite from Athens. And as we were waiting for the Pope and the Cardinals to come in for the service, we were looking around this wonderful, amazing thing. Lots of you will have been there. And all down one wall, there are pictures, paintings of Jesus. All down the other wall, there are paintings of Moses. And then at the far end, behind the high altar, there is this extraordinary last judgment and some people going this way and some people going that way. And my Archimandrite friend, he said, this I understand, and that I understand, that I do not understand. He said, we just don't do eschatology like that. And to my frustration, at that moment, the procession of the Pope and the Cardinals came in, and that was the end of the conversation. I still want to ask him, OK, tell me what you would have put there instead. Because that doesn't mean that they're universalists. Some Greek Orthodox are universalists, just like some um, Westerners are. But um, it seems to me that C.S. Lewis got it at least nearly right in The Great Divorce, that heaven and hell are not equal and opposite. Hell is a denial. This is why I say it's kind of incomprehensible. Hell is an absurdity because here are image-bearing creatures who have persistently and constantly denied and said, I don't want to be reflecting God into the world and I don't want to reflect the praises of the creation back to the creator. I don't want to be human. And it seems to me at the moment... This is how what I've said in Surprise by Hope, which is, I've got a tiny section there on, on this, um, that that is a way of saying, I, I am colluding with my own dehumanization. And again, as with all the rest, there's plenty of picture language you can use for that to express what a horrible and sad and tragic thing that is. But again, we shouldn't, as with the book of Revelation, shouldn't mistake the imagery for a kind of advanced videotape of what it's going to look like. It seems to me those images are ways of saying this is a terrible thing. And yes, some people do actually embrace that route. They not only destroy their own humanness, but try to take as many other people as they can with them and it seems to me to that god says no not because he is a malevolent or brutal or malicious god um, but because the fact is that he loves his creation and he loves his human creatures um, and therefore ultimately he cannot have in his ultimate new creation anything as revelation 21 and 22 says says that loves or makes a lie um, you know, the idea of the lie is very powerful there, that the lie is, no, I'm not really in the image of God, so I'm going to exploit this creation, I'm going to worship it, I'm going to take some of its force and power, I'm going to have fun with that, um, and who cares? Um, there's a terrifying moment at the end of William Golding's novel, Pincher Martin, where the anti-hero, as he is drowning, is suddenly aware of um, somebody asking him, wouldn't you like to change your mind, as it were? And I won't quote what he says because it's pretty violent and nasty, but he basically is saying, nope, I don't want that. Thank you very much. Um, away. And, and it seems to be Golding is saying that this is a sort of denial of one's own humanness. And, and therefore, as long as you have in your mind a picture of hell, which is human beings being tortured, that is not, it seems to me, what's going on because this is... If, if it exists, it's creatures who once were human and now are not. Now, that takes me quite close to what some have called an annihilationist position, which I think was where John Stott was, and, and others likewise. Um, it's, it's a sort of quasi-annihilation, if you like, in that it's uh, the annihilation of the humanness. If you can imagine, it's a horrible thought, and I, I, you know, I don't like talking about this. If you imagine a creature that once was human and now is not, I think this is what Lewis was getting at in um, The Last Battle, when he has some of the talking beasts who just are now ordinary, non-talking beasts. Um, again, this is not a pleasant thing to talk about, but that's just a way of saying, no, I'm not a universalist, and I don't think we have to be universalists. Um, at the same time, I can well understand how a lot of people, somebody who's talking to me just now, brought up with the fear of hell from a very early age, naturally react against that and say, that God is a monster. And I know that, I think this is the, uh, the problem that Rob Bell was reacting against in his little booklet on this. Yeah, yeah. We, we, it's, 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 that, that's kind of impressionistic book. It's not, a, it's not actually a sustained argument. It's kind of putting out 
which is an interesting way of doing it, actually, because maybe that's where our culture is, that you just have to say, what about this? Hang on, had you thought about that? Et cetera, et cetera. We need to wrestle with those issues, but it's not a full statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's enough about hell. Talk about something else. <laughs> yeah, but, oh, well, oh, well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we d maybe just did that. We, yeah, I, I, I think Sistine is spelt wrongly there as well, but um, uh, sorry, that's... that's <laughs> How... <laughs> What would you have put at the end of the Sistine Chapel if you were... I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think I might have tried to do a Revelation 21, 22, um, the New Jerusalem, heaven and earth together, the water of life flowing out, the, leaves, the, the tree of life on either side of the river, and the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. That's a wonderful image. Right, right. Thank you. How does Paul's now and not yet correlate with Jesus' teaching that this generation will not have passed away before all this has happened? Okay, it's uh, again, we were talking about this at lunch the other day. It's very clear in Luke 21. I think it's pretty clear in Mark 13. It's more controversial in Matthew 25, 24. Um, but uh, in Luke 21 and Mark 13, at least, it is clear that what Jesus is talking about is the fall of Jerusalem. The, the whole discourse begins with, uh, hey, look at these stones. Actually, they're all going to come crashing down. Okay, when's that going to happen? How will we know what's going on? And then you get, and then you get all this apocalyptic imagery. Well, of course, if Jerusalem is the place where the living God has chosen to put his name, and if now Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and the temple destroyed and never rebuilt... What language are you going to use except the sun and the moon being darkened and the stars falling from heaven and all of that? This is, you know, John Barton, my colleague once in Oxford, says in his book on Old Testament um, exegesis, he says, if we read this line that the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon will turn into blood and the stars will be falling from heaven, he said, as a matter of literary genre, we know that the next line is not going to be that the rest of the country will have scattered showers and sunny intervals. You know, this is, this is, not a primitive weather forecast. Um, this, this, is, this is borrowing the language of cosmic collapse to denote the this worldly events, which precisely because of who God is and what the temple was there for, this is to do with the unmaking of the cosmology that we had lived with. Um, you know, that, that language goes back to Isaiah 13, where it's clearly for Babylon, etc. My teacher, George Caird, pointed out that in Jeremiah, Jeremiah prophesied that because of the wickedness of Jerusalem, the Babylonians would come, Jerusalem would fall, and he said, this will be creation going back to tohu abohu, that is, going back to being without form and void. Now, for, for years, Jeremiah lived with the fear that Jerusalem would not be destroyed and that he would be proved to be a false prophet prophet. But when Jerusalem was destroyed, nobody thought he was a false prophet because the world had, come, had not come to an end. You know, we, we are just so bad at reading apocalyptic language. Uh, the best book on that is George Caird's last book, which is called The Language and Imagery of the Bible. If you don't know that book, it's a wonderful read, and it will, if you're bothered about any of that stuff that I've just said, this will help you. Um, it really will. Thank you very much. What is the role of the of departed saints, the ah. cloud of witnesses, and the intercession of the saints? That's, yeah, it's a nice question. Um, <clears throat> I, I come and go on this because we are not told in Scripture almost anything about what those who have loved Jesus and are now at rest are doing at the moment. In Revelation 6, they are souls under the altar. That's close you get. And they are saying, how long, O Lord, how long? They are, pray they are praying. They are praying that God will do the thing for which he's, which he's promised. And they're told to rest and wait. And here's a nice white robe to keep you happy while we're going on. Um, and, and, you know, this is all this imagery of saying God looks after them, God loves them. But they are sharing our prayer that God's kingdom will come and God's justice will flood the whole world. I, I don't believe myself at the moment that such departed brothers and sisters actually are aware of what we're doing. I, I really don't think that. Uh, partly, I suspect that's just fear. I just don't want my... 
beloved people who've died to see how much I'm messing up myself now. Just, just, just you know, get on, worship God, and I'll, I'll join you in due, due course. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> The Eastern Orthodox pray not only for the saints, but with the saints. Oh, so not only with the saints, but for the saints. But um, there's a sort of sense of that as a total uh, mutual prayer, that we are still praying for one another. Um, the, the problem, of course, in the 16th century was that purgatory, uh, I think we sometimes forget just how massive purgatory was in the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, Stephen Greenblatt's book, um, Hamlet in Purgatory, a brilliant, brilliant book, going through just the way in which purgatory dominated Western European culture in the 14th to 15th century. So that the whole question was, how long are you going to spend there? How will you get out? What will be going on? Um, how do we make life easier for the people who are there? And it was just huge. And so the reformers quite naturally, rereading scripture where it doesn't occur, um, said, uh, no, actually, and anything to do with that is no as well. So you don't pray for anyone who's departed because that implies that you're believing some kind of doctrine of purgatory. Now, I don't believe in purgatory at all, but I pray in celebration for those who've gone on ahead. Um, and I do so gladly. And it seems to me praying that God will look after them, will give them light and refreshment and peace, and that they with us will come to the joyful resurrection. It seems to me that's a perfectly okay thing. To, I remember dear old Professor Norman Anderson. Do you remember? You probably knew him yeah. when you were working with John. Um, Norman Anderson had lost all his three children in early adult life in their 20s and early 30s. That's just a, an extraordinary thing. And he, when they had the debate on the new liturgies in General Synod about, and the question of prayer for the departed came up, he made a speech and as a leading evangelical, nobody expected him to support prayer for the departed. And he said, I pray for my children. I don't think they're in purgatory, but I say, Lord, I hope you're looking after them. I hope you're finding great things for them to do. Um, you know, thank you for them. I'm puzzled that you've taken them, but I commit them to you. And see, that's a perfectly okay thing to do. Even in the context of what you were saying earlier about the fact that we know so little, even that much concreteness is different than I was hearing earlier. Yeah, yeah. But so there's an edge of, it's like a, a sort of penumbra. There's a quality yeah, of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, that is an act of, of faith and hope. We don't have hardly any information about such people, information by, by that I mean in scripture. Um, Obviously, in many Christian traditions, there are many saints who are invoked for different purposes. Um, and the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox have, have taken, developed that to an art form. And uh, um, uh, Pope Francis just made two of his predecessors saints just the other day. Um, quite exciting, really, because I've um, met one of them and it uh, means I've shaken hand with a saint. I just didn't, didn't know I was going to be doing that. But, um. <laughs> So I'm pushing on this a little bit more. <clears throat> I, there may be more questions about this, but I want to just uh, add a little more. Lots of people here are in the process or are already pastors. They're serving in congregations. Sure. So they're, they're going to be, uh, they have and will be meeting with people who are facing their own death as well as the death of loved ones. And the language that's there in the culture has been so much about so-and-so is going to go and meet so-and-so in order for them to sing together, pray together, love together, celebrate together, party together, depending on who you're talking about. And... And all of that uh, ends up feeling like it's such concrete language of assurance. How does all this get translated into just some words of advice that you might give for how you preach on these subjects, how you pastorally care for your congregation, given that there's such a steady, ready stock yeah, yeah, of yeah, images? Yeah. How do you transfer yeah, yeah. them to a more biblical vision? Yeah, in, in, in my world, in the more uh, low-key Middle Anglican world that, that's been where I've lived much of my life, you don't have quite that extent of developed um, topography, as it were. Um, Let me assure and, you. Yeah, no, I, no, I, 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 can, I can well believe, and I've seen, I've seen bits of it. Um, and I think most people in my tradition would say, as we said before, the, the task of the pastor and preacher then is to point to the new creation, to point to the resurrection, to point to the assurance of final hope. The danger with making it um, uh, something that they're all going to at the moment is then when you take funerals for people who actually half the congregation know this guy was a scoundrel and he deceived people and cheated on his wife and he, you know, abused old ladies and small children or whatever it may be, you know. Um, and yet people are still talking about, you know, going and meeting and this and that. And that just, uh, you know, what's that about? What, what message does that convey? Um, 
And one of the great lines from the old Anglican prayer book um, liturgy of, of funeral is, uh, we commit our brother, our sister to the Lord in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the dead. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've often just substituted for that a vague and sentimental hope for uh, a nice party immediately now. And, um, yeah, I just don't think that's helpful. So, but, but one of the things to say, of course, is the time to preach about all of this is not at the funeral. The time to preach about all of this is, is in the regular course of preaching and teaching, so that when the funeral happens, you are drawing with your people on a reservoir of biblical wisdom which you've laid out before, them, before that happens. Um, funeral sermons, it is a great opportunity to preach the gospel, um, not, I think, in a kind of revivalist fashion with an altar call at the end, that would kind of make the wrong point in a funeral, but um, to, to make it quite clear that in Christ God has launched his new creation and you are invited in the power of the Spirit to be part of that. That can be said and really, really can be heard in a funeral. And I'd rather have that said at funerals than these endless fluffy eulogies which gloss over the realities often. And heavenly speculation. And heavenly speculation, yeah. quite, quite. Next question. Since we believe in Jesus' bodily resurrection, where is he now? He's in heaven. And of course he's in heaven. We believe in the resurrection and the ascension. But the point, again, let me stress, the point about heaven is that it is the CEO's office. Heaven is where earth is run from. And heaven and earth are not far away from one another. As in, I mean, if already in the temple in Jerusalem, they believed that heaven and earth were there together, so that when you were in the temple, it wasn't as if you were in heaven, you were in heaven, then how much more... If in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends into heaven, that means there is a bit of earth, of stuff, of our world, which is already in heaven. And if that blows your categories, then get some new categories. You know, um, I used to debate with Marcus Borg um, when we wrote that book together, and we went on the road and we debated frequently, and it actually got a bit boring because we both knew each other's lines. It's like playing tennis with somebody just again and again. Okay, I know you play that shot. And, uh, um, and Mark and I are good friends, but uh, at this sort of point in the discussion, he would say... Tom, I just can't imagine that. And I would say, Mark, you need to work on your imagination. Um, you know, because it, it means you're, you're still coming with a basically platonic vision of heaven in which a body would be out of place. Sorry, God's heaven and earth are meant for one another. That's what Genesis 1 is all about. That's what the temple was all about. And so the ascension, part of this earth is now in heaven, Pentecost Acts 2, the breath of heaven is now animating us on earth. These are both temple images, which is why in the book of Acts, all the pressure points are about temples, whether it's in chapter 7 or 17 or 24 or wherever. Um, it's not surprising because there's a new temple launched in the world like nobody had ever imagined before. And the existing temples are shivering in their shoes, quite rightly. Let's take one more question, then we'll take a break. Though it's outside the topics of, <laughs> okay. Though it's outside the topics of your lectures, the issue of homosexuality is splitting the church and discrediting the church in the eyes of many societies. Please give us some guidance on Paul's view of homosexuality and how we should address this painfully complex reality. Uh, uh, what I've often said to people is that um, part of the difficulty with not using a proper lectionary is that um, when people read only the bits of the Bible which they think are fit to be read out in church. The bits they miss out are to do with hell and sex. And the trouble is there's a lot of hell and sex in real life, and so people think the Bible's irrelevant. And now, so it doesn't surprise me this comes up. It is obviously the hot-button topic of our day. Um, I was in conversation with a colleague who's writing something about this at the moment just the other day on the email, and we were agreeing that there are so many different layers to this specific issue that to address just one of those layers um, means that at once everyone gets confused about all the others. And the only way we can really get at it, it's like what I found when I wrote about the resurrection in the big book on the resurrection. I thought that was going to be a 200-page book. It turned out to be a 700-page book because at every point there were misunderstandings. And it seems to me within postmodernism, 
within late Western neo-morality, within late degenerate Protestantism, which simply says, oh, we don't believe in law because we believe in grace. There are lots of different strands, culturally, biblically, socially, philosophically, religiously, which have got us to the place where we can no longer deal with, not just that actually, but lots of other issues. I mean, I'd much rather talk about more about global debt because, you know, that's the one that's killing people out there in the, in the, in the wider world. Um, but of course, sexual behavior is important because being human is important, because what you do with your body is important, because in the Bible there is no such thing as casual sex, that, that all sexual behavior um, has a hotline to who we really are. And, and actually, people know that in their bones, um, but they disguise it because our culture is saying, you must do more of this, you must do more of this because that's what it means to be human. It's one of the great lies of our time. Like you must make more and more and more money because that's what it means to be human. Or you must go and drop bombs on people because that's what it means to be human. Sorry, Aphrodite, Mars, um, Mammon are killing us and we have to learn to say no to all of them. Um, and uh, that's very difficult because these are the idols of our culture. So it's a matter of idolatry. And, and always idolatry generates um, dehumanizing behavior. It's also a matter of how we understand who we are as human beings. And where did this idea come from that our identity has to do with our sexual desires and preferences? That's, that's a totally new thing. And yet it's now a given in Western culture. And that's very, very bizarre, actually. Um, as a pastor, I know because people have sat in my study and have told me that sexual identity and desire, sexual identity and desires can swing around this way and that, can do all sorts of things. And trying to set your identity by them is like going for a walk in the mist and taking a compass bearing on a mountain goat. You know, that's going to move, actually, and you may fall over a cliff. So, I mean, there's all sorts of issues there. And Paul's view... Paul only talks about this, of course, very, very rarely, but it just does happen that it's right in the middle of Romans 1, where it's part of his description of idolatry and dehumanization. And part of what's going on there is the line from there to Romans 4, the contrast between the Adamic humanity in which this kind of thing happens there, and in Romans 4, he's using the same language about Abraham giving glory to God, and then astonishingly, he and Sarah are fruitful even though they're past the age. There's a kind of implicit contrast there. And that's kind of something at the deep structure of Romans about the rehumanizing of human beings. But these are all preliminary notes towards preliminary notes towards something that might eventually carefully, pastorally, wisely be, be said. Obviously, people are in great pain on this issue from a number of of angles and you know as a pastor I've met that again and again throughout my working life so I don't say any of this casually or cheaply um, I had a very moving email not that long ago from a friend who I've been very close to who I knew that he was not married and that probably his instincts were in that direction but he finally emailed and said that he was having a civil partnership with another man and we had a wonderful exchange of emails where I was trying to be as frank as I could about still being a friend and yet he needed to know this is where I was which didn't surprise him I, to my relief I waited for a day with bated breath and I got this lovely email back saying thank you for being honest I really appreciate that I would have thought less of you if you hadn't told me what I thought you probably thought um, and this is very difficult pastorally because then if you're not careful and even saying this now probably being recorded um, this could be taken out of context put on YouTube somewhere and I would get hate mail because that's happened before um, so you know we take our lives in our hands because we're dealing with with major cultural ideologies at the moment and prayer, love, scripture, pastoral care is the way most of us have to deal with this and pray for a new generation of wise theological ethicists who can articulate like Richard Hayes has done in his chapter in the moral vision of the New Testament only preferably more so um, the way we should go. Hmm. We'll pause there. We're going to take a brief break of about five minutes, and then we'll come back together for our final conversation. <laughs> 